Everybody says, isn't this very negative? Isn't this very negative? Well, you know, if you continue in the way that I do, eventually there's absolutely nothing left. <laughs> that's the end result. Except one thing. And that's Jesus. All crutches disappear, and he's the only one that's left. And if you can get to that point, wow, that's great. Then there's only one choice. And all the other options have fallen by the wayside. Isn't that where we want to get? So, yes, maybe it does appear negative. And one thinks, why must I know all these things? You don't. You really don't have to remember a thing that I say. It doesn't really matter. As long as it registers... I have to help my friend who's in the so-and-so movement. I have to help my friend who is in the New Age movement. I have to help, 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 I have to help. If that's what comes out, well, that's, that's what I want to achieve. That's it. That's the bottom line. Calling people out of Babylon into the beauty of his light. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, may we once again approach your throne of grace and ask you, Lord, to give us an outpouring of your Spirit. May your angels that excel in strength surround this place, and may there be such an imbibing Spirit with us that we may know that you are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the only one who can save us, and prepare this world for your soon coming. Bless us this evening, Lord, as we discuss some of these issues. And give us your sweet spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what I like about my faith, our faith, your faith? Is its simplicity. It's so simple. There are no rituals that I have to follow. There are no mechanisms that I have to go through. All of these things. When I was a Catholic, oh, I had to do so many things. I had to do this. I had to do that. I had to go down on my knees. If I didn't say enough Hail Marys in a day, I was in trouble, you know. I had to go through so many things. If you're in the, in the spiritualistic world, there are so many Doorways to cross to reach the enlightenment. If you're in any one of the organizations in the world out there, imagine being a poor Freemason. How much it costs to get to the 33rd degree just to be lost in the end. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? And all that learning and all that stuff. When it comes to Jesus... Ah, what a relief. Amen. He's my friend. I get up in the morning and I say, wow, thank you, Lord. Here I am again. And uh, what a nice experience to have him with you all day. You speak to him, you walk with him, you talk to him. He's your friend. Amen. When you're in trouble, you put your head on his shoulder and you say, Lord, I've got all these problems. And you pour them out upon him, and he just takes it. He's such a, what do you call him, the Monday sucker for punishment. He takes us all. <laughs> he's so kind, he's so gentle, and there's no hocus pocus. You talk to him like you talk to your wife. That close. That close. It's so beautiful. No nonsense. So tonight we're going to speak about the New Age agenda. We're still busy with the three angels' messages. Have you noticed that? We're talking about the three angels' messages. And we're still in the second angel. We haven't gotten out of him yet. And we won't get out of him until the last day. Then we'll jump to the third angel's message and the culmination of all things. Now, in the first night, you remember... We looked at the all-controlling power behind the scenes on earth, his representative, the beast. 
And then we looked how through the union of the beast and spiritualism, everything crept into, since 1844, the false prophet. We looked at that. Now what's left? The dragon. So tonight we have to look at the dragon component. And then we'll have Babylon more or less defined. There are still some units that are involved in Babylon. But we won't be able to deal at all. But that will be the gist of the matter. And then eventually we have to add that the kings of the, of the earth are in harmony and union with Babylon. And then we go to the third angel's message. That's how we will uh, approach this subject. So tonight, the New Age agenda. What is it all about? And how does it fit into the three angels' messages? Now we've already seen what this false spirit teaches, what his occult message is, and we can now, because we've learned that, identify it. See, oh, oh, yeah, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here, and you can pick it up. You can say, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Doesn't it make matters easier to identify between right and wrong? Yes, I think so. So, even if it's negative, it warns us, and it enables us, that's the crux of the matter, to warn our friends and the friends of Jesus out there in the world. Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard de Chardin, mm, I'm sorry, he's another Jesuit. But uh, he's dead now. He is the father of the New Age movement. And he's just about the patron saint of the United Nations. He dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the Omega point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. So once you read just that one sentence, you already realize we're dealing with one of the twin lies of Eden. Is that correct? He wants to realize his own godhood. He's the most quoted New Age occultist writer, and he was a French Jesuit. He wrote in Christianity and Evolution, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. Now, if you think about it logically, that's the only way you could get harmony on earth. It's a fact. How are you going to get Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Shintoism, all the isms in the world to come together in one happy unit if they don't have a Christ who satisfies them all? There is no other solution for mankind if we want to have peace on this earth and if this is going to be the final home, there is no other solution. Of course, if you know that this is not the final home, and if you know that there is only one Christ, well then the picture changes. Then either everybody accepts the real Christ, or you're going to have a division into two distinct classes. Those who accept this Christ that satisfies them all except me. And those who accept the one who said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am your creator and your redeemer. You are mine by creation and by purchase. That's our choice. There's no other way so let's not be surprised that they all merge into one. They have no choice if they want a kingdom on earth. So now, who is moving behind the scenes to accomplish this? It has to be the other spirit, the one who sets himself up as the creator, as the architect of the universe. And that spirit 
is in direct opposition to Christ and his word. So the Gnostics, they taught that Jesus Christ was not what he claimed to be, God, but that he was just an example of our godhood. You see? So Jesus Christ is demoted so that he is acceptable to any other religious form. He's on a level with Zoroaster. He's on a level with Krishna. He's on a level with whoever out there, the Iman Mahdi of the Islam. But Islam doesn't accept Jesus as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God. So we had the different religious groupings, the Ebionites, the Gnostics, the Thomasines, the Marcionites, and all of these movements had this one goal. And in the inner circle of the occult, the aim has always been to unite all of these and to bring the populace to a position of thinking where they will adopt all of them as equal. This is the modern trend. This is a dangerous trend. Behind the scenes, you have these special forces of the Roman Catholic Church concentrating on occultism. These are the wandering bishops, the Congress of Wandering Bishops. It's good that we skipped that one all by itself, so it doesn't really matter. Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, is it so that God has said? Satan always questions God's word. He always puts question marks where there are statements. Be careful of that. You shall not eat of every garden of the tree. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That was a statement of fact. <laughs> said the devil, you shall not surely die. I think God's wrong. For God knows something that you don't know. That in the day that you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's the hub of spiritualism. That's that portion around which everything revolves. And the problem of mankind is summed up here. And the woman saw, in other words, we see and we start getting distracted. That the tree was good for food. Doesn't look bad to me. And that it was pleasing to the eye. Why would God keep something hmm, tantalizingly interesting away from us? And the tree to be desired to make wise. I want to be in another class. I want to be better than others. That's what the whole drug world does. It induces the feeling of, I am above that, you're not there yet. You know, like some perfectionists, hmm, you're not there yet. You don't understand. So she took of the tree and of the fruit and she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So let's admit it, men, we're just as guilty. Now, how does this thinking come into Christianity, where it is today, as we saw yesterday? Well, it, it started with pseudo-Christianic movements, like, for example, Christian science, which is not science, and it's not Christian. So Christian science is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist in this context. The founder of Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, was voted one of the 75 books by women whose words have changed the world by the USA's Women's National Book Association. That's quite something. That's quite something. Here are some of the statements from her book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures. Evil has no reality. It is neither person, place, nor thing. It's simply a belief, an illusion of material sense. So there is no evil. I always wonder what planet she lived on. Jesus, now what is he? The highest human corporeal concept of the divine idea, rebuking and destroying error and bringing to light man's immortality. So 
So there we go. There's the problem already, right? So Jesus is an example bringing to light our divinity, and therefore, if we're divine, well, then we're immortal. Let us remember that harmonious and immortal man has existed forever. That makes us gods. Page 302. Death? Well, then there is no death. It's an illusion. The lie of life and matter, any material evidence of death is false. It contradicts the spiritual fact of being. So the body is just a tent that you use until you do whatever you do when you go to the other side. And the soul is divine, you see. The divine principle of man and never sins, hence the immortality of the soul. What a magnificent doctrine. So in my body I can do anything. I can do the worst things under the sun. It doesn't matter. That's why there's no sin, you see. Because my spiritual being is God and holy and it cannot sin. And whether I am evil or whether I am, well, let's not call it evil, whether I am dark or whether I am light, darkness or light, it makes no difference. Whether I worship in the light form, Lucifer, or in the dark form, Satan, it makes no difference. This is spiritualism at its worst. Man and woman as coexistent and eternal with God, forever reflecting glorified equality, the infinite father-mother God. You see, now you have androgenism. So now you have the androgenic male-female God. Who's that? Is that Jesus or is that Baphomet? This is Baphomet, because Jesus was male-female, or was he male? He was male, yes. Wasn't he circumcised on the eighth day? Well, that makes him male in my book. <laughs> now, the next one is the Mormon movement. The Mormon movement. Now, where did they come from? Well, the angel... Moroni is the one who gave this message to Joseph Smith. And there is Joseph Smith, the prophet of the New Age movement, and following him we have Brigham Young. Now, who were these gentlemen? Now, according to the source over here, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, Mormonism, its founder Joseph Smith was a high-level Freemason. His successor, Brigham Young, was also another high Freemason. And according to the book Black Robe, Brigham Young was an intimate friend of Peter de Smet, one of the most powerful American Jesuits of the 19th century. So whenever there's something weird, you look for a, a Jesuit. And he received this light, and uh, let's ask him whether he was a Freemason. Joseph Smith, were you a Freemason? He writes in his history of the church, he's saying this, in the evening, I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge, assembled in my general business office. I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. So was he a 33-degree Freemason, yes or no? Yes, he says so himself. So we know his theology. And we know that there must be a link with the occult arm, the esoteric arm of the beast power. And Desmet is our key. Now, these are all front organizations to bring about a change in mankind and to perform particular functions. Now, the function of this organization, which, as you can see, has particular hand signals, wears aprons, has the regalia of Freemasonry in its religious rituals, again, give us this idea that here is some occult activity. This is their main center in Salt Lake City. Their churches, just like um, Masonic temples, don't have windows. They are in darkness. You're not allowed into their churches unless you are initiated into the ceremony. They have the all-seeing eye, the hand of fellowship of Freemasonry right on top of their main door. They have the inverted pentagrams. Former witch, Mason, Mormon, Satanist, Bill Schnurbel writes that the magician, the inverted pentagram, has one use only, and that is to call up the power of Satan. So these people know what they're all about. And uh, upside down pentagrams all over the place, plus the symbols of the sun, moon, star, uh, the all-seeing eyes, the circles with the dots in them, 
the hexagrams, which have nothing to do with Judaism, unless you can show me in the Bible that David carried a star, which he didn't. And, of course, the Aaronic priesthood. You see? Here is their statue outside of Christ giving this Aaronic priesthood to the Mormons. The restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. Now, if you know your Bibles, then you know there's no such thing as the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood because that was a type, and type met anti-type and kissed at the cross. There is only one high priest today, and he serves in a temple not made by human hands. Correct? So any temple we want to build on earth is a counterfeit finished. Because our worship is upwards, not downwards. So this is not from God. This is another priesthood. Both Masonry and Mormonism refer to the Melchizedek priesthood. In Scottish Rite Masonry, the 19th degree is called the Grand Pontiff. It is during this ceremony that the candidate is anointed with oil, is made and proclaimed a priest forever according to the order of of Melchizedek. What would you call that? I would call it blasphemy. Because there is only one priest who is of the order of Melchizedek, and that is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. No one else. So here, people are making themselves Christ. So here again, you have the inerrant divinity of man exalting itself over the word of God. You see, Jesus says every knee will bow. These people do not want to bow because they are gods in themselves. But on the outside, the outer portico of the temple, it is magnificent. You watch the Mormon choir. It is the most beautiful choir in the world. Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they sing the songs of Jesus. This is, this is wonderful. It's the most marvelous thing. And people say, well, this must be from God. No, it is not. It is not from God. You can just read their statements. Yet the pomp and the glamour that they have and the money, where does all this money come from? Well, let's look at the Mormon doctrine. Here's section 27, Doctrine of Covenants. Adam was God. Well, you have the same story as Kenneth Copeland gave last night. Some sins are atoned for by own blood only. Salvation by works. Jesus was born in Jerusalem, that's a minor. Christ was married to Mary, Martha, and others. Journal of Discourses, volume 2, page 81 and 82. Well, you know, they have to justify the problem that they have there, so why not just put that in over there? One of the most pernicious doctrines, this is Joseph Smith writing himself, one of the most pernicious doctrines ever advocated by man is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which has entered into the hearts of millions since the days of the so-called Reformation. Well, that's what I would expect from a Jesuit to write something like that, wouldn't you? There it is. Then in 2 Nephi 2, 22 to 25, Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. So Adam fell so that man might have joy. That's glorifying sin. Uh, Sterling Stilley was a member of the first quorum of the 70s, stated in the church section, under Christ, Adam yet stands as head. Adam fell, but he fell in the right direction. <laughs> he fell towards the goal. Adam fell, but he fell upward. Jesus says to us, come up higher. So this is another Jesus. This is not my Jesus. Definitely not mine. Brigham Young went further. He wrote in the Doctrine of Covenants, The devil told the truth about Godhead. I do not blame Mother Eve. I would not have her miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, humanity can achieve godhood. Do you pick up the same doctrine everywhere? Are we getting sort of, you know, au fait with it? 
You were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. So there you have all these statements. In the Mass, the fault is also exalted because the Catholic Mass has this statement, O oh, blessed fault. So the fault is exalted. Then you have all kinds of occult symbols like the bee and the hive and the, all the keys and cosmic keys, all these symbols. You can read it in the two Babylons. Now, there is some truth in the matter that occultism today is controlled by elite families. And, uh, of course, the Mormon movement is the one that maintains a register of every single human being in the world. That's their job for the inner order. So if you want to know where you come from, you go into the Mormon computer, it'll tell you who your great-grandfather was all the way back to Adam. Now, they had a chart against the wall because uh, President Bush had been elected, so they had his family tree, which was fascinating. So I photographed it. This is the Howland family chart. Now you tell me whether this is coincidence. So the great, 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 great grandfather of the president up there was also the great, great grandfather of Joseph Ira Earl, Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon movement, so he's related to George W. Bush. Emma Hale, Winston Churchill, was related. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, President Ford, President George Bush Sr., President George Bush Jr. Coincidence? Stretching it, right? Stretching it. If you want to be in the space program and get anywhere, you either be a Mormon or a Mason. Because there's no difference between the two, actually. It's exactly the same. I photographed President Ford signing himself as a 33-degree Freemason there in the Masonic Lodge, one of them into which I managed to sneak. So there it is. Evidence in his own handwriting, on his own picture. And the Scottish Rite uh, calendar will give you all of these names and will tell you that the mega cosmonauts and, and astronauts of the world are all in a circle uh, Mason, so all the space ones, whether you talk about Colonel John Glenn or any one of them, in the presidential galleries of the Masonic lodges, all the presidents are listed. The last ones are always left out. They will be added in future years. So here's another movement giving itself a Christian flavor, which has nothing to do with Christianity but uses mysticism. Now, the New Age was the journal that uh, Freemasonry used to give out. But then, you know, they were linked to the New Age, so they changed the name to Scottish Rite Journal. Here are some of the books that are paramount in telling us what occultism is about. Of course, Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine is very, very important. I briefly want to just say something about Jehovah's Witnesses as well. You know what I like about Jehovah's Witnesses? Their sincerity. They're so sincere. And uh, we're always scared when they knock on the door. Not me. I love it. I invite them in. Always. Please come in. Because it's, it's an ev evangelistic opportunity. Jehovah's Witnesses. Here's their original writing. Notice that they have the divine plan of the ages. There they have the symbol of the god Ra on it. Now, that should make you a little bit nervous. This is an original watchtower. I photographed it directly from the watchtower. 1916, December 1. It has the symbol of the Knights Templars on it. Now, that links it to masonry. And here is the death is described of Brother Russell and we see the entire explanation of how in his death situation he had to be robed with a robe and toga so that he could die a Masonic death in the watchtower. Now, these poor people 
need perhaps to know where their organization hails from. Notice that all of them, all of them have something to do with Jesus. This organization makes Jesus less than he is in the Bible. And that should make us nervous. On his grave, you also have the Knights Templar symbol. These are all the unfulfilled predictions that they have. They predicted, for example, the coming of Christ, 1874, the resurrection, 1878, the close of the favor of the Gentiles, 1914, Armageddon, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob would be resurrected in 1915. Uh, the churches would be destroyed in 1918. The kingdom established in 1925 and then 1950. And by the way, in 19, after 1925, you could call up Abraham in Jerusalem and ask him to resurrect your, your brethren. Uh, the New World Bible, all of these interesting things. Here is their own writing concerning the times of the Gentiles. We consider it an established truth that the final end of the kingdoms of the world and the full establishment of the kingdom of God will be accomplished by the end of A.D. 1914. And sometime before the end, uh, the last member of the day's body of Christ will be glorified. Now, none of these things came true, and the Bible says, well, then don't worry about it. But what is the occult connection? You see, as long as millions of people in many, many sub-organizations can be brought to think that Jesus is less than the Bible says he is, then occultism achieves its aim. Because they have to eventually unite on a Christ that satisfies them all. So the more organizations you have that make Jesus less than he is and man more than he is, the more likely they are to achieve it. Now, in occultism, they use subliminals. So if you go to Jehovah's Witnesses' uh, journals, the Watchtower, for example, they use subliminals. Here in this picture, demonic faces in the hand. This is called the lion's paw grip. This is a Masonic handshake for lifting up uh, individuals. If you look at this drawing, it looks pretty innocuous there in the watchtower. If you turn it and you look a little bit closer, then you'll see hidden in the wood you have the goat's head uh, of hidden in the tree. If you turn some of these pictures around, you will see demonic faces hidden in the hair. And uh, they'll use keys, they'll use high occult symbols like the one with the finger just slightly removed. Try and remember that one where the little finger is just slightly removed from the side. That's a high occult uh, key symbol. They use Roman keys, and they use uh, Masonic subliminals like this angel. If you look at him carefully, the one foot is a goat's foot, and then he has the, the Masonic triangles and the pentagrams hidden in it. And this lady over here has a picture of the deity hidden subliminally in her dress. Anybody see it? Once you see it, you see it. If you don't see it, you don't see it. That's a subliminal. So you really have to look. Well, let's make it a little bit bigger. Can you see it now? Where is it? It's down there, right? Can you recognize the face? All right. If you still can't recognize it, let me give you who it is. There it is. It's that one. Now, who's that? That's Zeus. That's the head of the gods. That's the symbol of Lucifer. All right. Fascinating stuff. Or they'll use shadows to give Jesus a goat's foot, just like they did with the angel over there. Or they'll hide S's in the cloaks. Or they'll put subliminals over here, like here in this tree. It's very hard to see, but if you look carefully, you have the apis bull, which is Egyptian mythology, and they had the figure of Ra on top of it. In this waterfall, if you look very carefully, you can see in the waterfall a face. And if you turn it around, you'll see two other faces in it as well. There's one, and there's one. And all of these subliminals, let's not go into the details, but that's one of the techniques that occultists use to put uh, a message into minds. Another organization, so we've been through the Mormons, we've been through the Jehovah's Witnesses, is the Baha'i movement. That's a very interesting one. And the Baha'i movement is everywhere 
where there was a struggle between Christ and Babylon. So in Carmel, where there was the showdown, there you have one of their chief temples, their heritage temples here in Haifa. And this is on Mount Carmel, the shrine of the Bab. Now, that's fascinating. Here it is, and you can see some of the occult symbols on it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The eight-sided star, that's the two squares, one inside the other. It's the same star that Islam uses, by the way, uh, is a symbol of the god Sirius. Now, the Baha'i was founded in 1844. I always get excited when I find that date. And it was founded by the Baha'a'u'llā, known as the Bab. Now, what does that mean? The Bab means the gate. So here is the portal to God, the Bab. Bab el, Babel, portal to God. So here is another way to God. And the Bab el, being a God man himself, founded this organization. Now, again, just like with the Mormon movement, just like with all the others, who's always hiding in the background? The beast. So this is another front organization to champion a new cause. And that is the unity of all religions. So the Baha'is have the greatest representation at the United Nations of any religion in the world. Even greater than Catholicism. But of course they're just a front organization posing for something else. So the fundamental unity of all religions is the point to be established, the harmony of science and religion. That's why evolution has to be taught in all schools in the world, especially from the year 2005. Uh, attainment of world peace and uh, all of these issues. And they have a special United Nations link. So here are all these sub-organizations. I'm not going to go through them all. I just wanted to mention some of the main ones. Now, then you have the direct channeled messages from this Christ that satisfies them all directly to the rest of the New Age fraternity. Again, if you look at the teachings of the Christ, you'll find pillars of Yachim and Boaz. You will find Taurus the bull, the ram, Piscus, Krishna, Buddha, all of them, linking them all together and making Jesus just one of the masters, making him less than he is. And this is called now the age of enlightening, the new dawn, the age of Aquarius. This is when mankind will undergo a mega transition in its psyche to accept this new age Christ. And to do this, you have the cosmic keys and the talismans and the pyramid power and the astrology and the natural healing and the hands of light and the tarot cards and the uh, Gnostic writings, the Enochian workbooks and seeds and magic and witchcraft all intermingled. And whether it comes from a light source or a dark source, it doesn't matter. It's the same deity. And that's the ultimate pantheism, the fusion of all religions into one, acknowledging their own divinity and the acceptance of its manifestation in the New Age Christ. Then you actually have a form of panentheism. That's the ultimate aim. So witchcraft is just as readily accepted as the other side. And, of course, this is the great master of the universe, the Illuminati of the firmament, the power of the exalted Illuminati, that is Lucifer, that is being worshipped. Now in Deuteronomy 18.10, the Bible tells us, There shall not be found amongst you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, that uses divination, or an observer of times, enchanter, a witch, a charmer, a consulter, a familiar spirits, a wizard, a nextromancer. These are all very specific categories. And every single government in the world has every one of those levels as its advisor today. That's scary. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Very straight talk. And yet, 
Here you have voices from heaven telling us that we have a noble um, origin as gods. Virginia uh, Scene, one of the modern channels, says death is the creation of humanity, not of God. There is no death. Here you are, the New Age books, the life of death. You cannot die. Who's that speaking, the serpent or the Lord God? Serpent. It's the serpent speaking. Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. You know the text. I don't have to go through it. Neither also their love, their hatred, their envy has now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. It's so easy. One text and all of this is lies. It's lies. So they can tell the future. When I was in occultism, I could see the aura of every human being. And I watched it. When someone came into my office in the university, I looked at his aura, and if it was red, I knew, oh, be careful, this man's angry, he's in a bad mood. If it was nice and light and on the bluish side, I'd say, hi, how are you doing? No, fine, everything's okay. You see, I'm so glad I don't do that anymore. There's no such thing. But these things are real. They are actually there. The living tarot and uh, alchemy. And notice the symbol of the rose. The rose is always a symbol of Lucifer. But of course, God made the rose, so you can still give your wife a rose, okay? Don't get hooked up on symbols. They're not important. Satan claims everything for himself. But uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a thief and a robber. He took it from someone that doesn't belong to him. And so the ancient magic of alchemy means to transform yourself from the realization that you are mere mortal to the realization that you are God. That's true alchemy. And eventually the fusion of male and female into androgyny. Can you see that over there? With the twin pillars of the faith being, of course, Balhadad and Apollo in his male form. Or you could put the female form there. It doesn't make any difference. Now to make this popular with the children... You can have the Harry Potter series where you have uh, J.K. Rowling or uh, Mary Grand Prix, who's the artist. She also is the artist for the, the films like um, The Ant and all of those where the ant realizes his nobility and starts rebelling against the establishment and all of these things. And the, the names used in here are the actual names of demons used in higher occult circles. And they use scrambling of words like the occultists would do to hide certain concepts. Like there's a character in her writings called Vlablatsky, which is a scrambling of Blavatsky. So these are real occultists. Don't let yourselves be fooled. And uh, Christianity Today, which used to be Billy Graham's uh, magazine, says, this is wonderful, this is lovely, it's wonderful lessons. So don't let yourself be fooled like the rest of Christianity is. If you go to Europe, the kids come dressed like Harry Potter into church, and you have Harry Potter days in church. So sun, moon, star worship. Now let's go to some of these modern channels. One of the most prominent ones today is Jay-Z Knight. Now these are the popular channels. You also have channels for every continent. And these are the ones that serially, seriously talk to government, the medical fraternity, the sporting world, and tell them exactly which way things are to run. And uh, Jay-Z Knight, she talks to an entity called Ramta. She has many clients in the movie industry. Leviticus 19.31 says, Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And as is appointed unto men once to die, but hereafter the judgment. So if you know your Bible, you shouldn't be confused. Now, this is Jay-Z Knight, and uh, she's a pretty woman. And here are some of the regalia around her. Notice the symbolism. Again, it is high occult symbolism. And here is one of her messages. Throughout history, we have tried many different avenues to remind you of your greatness, your power, and the foreverness of your life. Immediately you know there's something wrong, right? We have been king, conqueror, crucified Christ. So Jesus just becomes one of the general 
teacher, friend, philosopher, anything that would permit knowledge to occur. At times we have intervened in your affairs to keep you from annihilating yourself so that life here would continue to provide a playground for your experience and your evolution into joy. Uh, Adamson, so that man could have joy. See? Occultism all over. Now, the sound on this one is not very good, but let's just see if we can bear with it. Encountered Ramta in February 1977 in Tacoma, Washington. She says she saw Ramta. Um, on a Sunday afternoon. On a Sunday afternoon. He appeared after my husband and I had been spending a week making pyramids. This is during the time. They were involved pyramid in pyramid power. power. Um, the rage. We were hikers. Um, the, the theory was that you put food under pyramids, it'll dehydrate and so on and so forth. So we, we built She's talking pyramids about pyramids, not good. And had them all over the kitchen. When Ramtha appeared as glittering light. He appeared as glittering, glittering light. Like you would take a handful of glitter and drop it through a ray of sunlight. He's like a ray of sunlight. What do you do? Sunday afternoon, it's not midnight. On a Sunday afternoon. The only thing I could say was, you're so beautiful, who are you? And a big broad smile came across that beautiful face and said, I am Ramtha, the Enlightened One, and I've come to help you over the ditch. Who are you? You're so beautiful. I'm Ramtha, the Enlightened One, and I've come to help you over the ditch. So mankind is going to be helped over the ditch. Now let's look at something else. Look at her hand and see what she says. To God in giving our power away to a concept that there was only one Son of God, for it begs the question, then who are you? We cannot give ourselves over to the concept that there is only one Son of God, for it begs the question, then who are you? So what is she saying? Jesus is not what he claims to be. He's less than he claims to be, and you are his equal. Now here is our own recording, and you can hear for yourself what the theology is. I hope my sound comes through well. It takes a while. What is the good news? Yeah, let's listen to this. The good, good news is the thing that the church holds blasphemous. That the only way we can explain common people to be divine is if they were God. And it's the one teaching they forbade anyone to have. There is only one place that God is explained in his most extraordinary and simple concept and that isn't the church it happens to be the nemesis of the church it's called science whoa then we're going to heavy music so what is the one teaching that the church does not want you to have is that you are God so there you have the New Age teaching. It's the same as the Masonic teaching. It's run by the same people behind the scenes. It's the same spirit. And the nemesis of the church, what's finally going to get rid of it? Science. The theory of evolution will be used to great effect and enforced to make God less than he is. This young man I know personally. He came to my office at the university and he'd just been put through one of the mega companies, in fact a government mega company, uh, the one that makes the lights work. He made, they made him walk through the fire because they wanted to train a new generation of leaders from the previously disadvantaged society and put them through mega occult training so that they could lead the people. But this young man had a problem. He had a conflict with his religion, and he explained to me exactly what they were doing and how it went. The Bible says you may not walk through the fire, but mega companies are making people do it. Here's a writing of Helen Shookman. Three startling months preceded the actual writing, of this book. It is a channeled book. It was written through. The writing was never automatic. I took it down in a shorthand notebook. So it was dictated to her. I asked, why me? And the answer is, 
that you have opened yourself. You must agree to a cooperate. See, Jesus never forces, so this one tries to copy her. Here's one of her interesting statements, which will tell you everything. There is no need for help to enter heaven, for you have never left. You don't need Jesus. Nobody needs Jesus. I'm not a body. I am free. The Spirit in me is God. They start with a mantra. They end with a mantra. There's nothing real that exists. The thought of God is my own thought. And God has a son and I'm his son. We're all one. The name of God is my deliverance from every thought of evil and sin because it is my own as well as his. We are God's. There is no death. Forget your dreams of sin and guilt. Doesn't that sound the same as Shula said? It's exactly the same theology. It's the same spirit. It's exactly the same th spirit. And then you have the science of Scientology, which just takes this whole concept and makes it more scientific. So you attach yourself to e-meters, and uh, they clear your karma. My poor wife, when she was 12 years old, had to go through the whole ritual. Most of the mega film stars in the world are Scientologists, and they have Scientology uh, marriages. This is a, a new age technology to put you on a fast track to becoming God or realizing your own godhood. And the keynote of the new world religion is divine approach. And there will be a new world religion will be the unifying of the great divine approaches. There's the crux of the matter. Just like the Baha'i has to do this in the United Nations, so the new age has to do it amongst the people. Prepare the mind of the people to accept the new age Christ, who is not Jesus Christ. So let's sum this up. The new age doctrine versus the Bible. The Bible says Jesus is the Son of God. The new age says he is one of the masters. The Bible says you are saved by grace. Through them you achieve Godhood through works. The Bible says there's only one way, that's Jesus. The New Age says you must discover the Christ consciousness within you. The Bible says Lucifer is the devil. The New Age says Lucifer is the true Son of God. The Bible says worship God. The New Age says worship the creation. It's pantheism. Man was created, says the Bible. Physical man evolved. Sp spiritual man has existed forever, says the New Age. The Bible says God is not part of the creation. The New Age says he is, pantheism. It, the Bible teaches resurrection. The New Age teaches reincarnation. The word is truth in the Bible. Truth is within. The Bible teaches us to wait for the second coming. The New Age works, waits for the cosmic Christ, the Maitreya. The Bible says turn from sin. The New Age says there is no sin. It's ignorance. Uh, the Bible says come become Christ-like through sanctification. The New Age says discover your own divinity. The greatest champion of the New Age movement was Mother Teresa. I hope I am converting. I don't mean what you think. In coming face to face with God, we accept Him in our lives. Then we are converting. We become a better Hindu, a better Muslim, a better Catholic, a better whatever we are. Can you see the influence to merge all the religions into one and accept one cosmic Christ? Now, if you look at the way in which religion is operated, it looks to the outside world as the ideal form of Christianity, taking care of the needs of everyone. But when taking care of the needs takes the place of true religion, the worship of the one true God, then you have a falsehood in there which leads millions astray. What approach would I use? For me, naturally, it would be Catholic. For you, it may be Hindu. For someone else, Buddhist. According to one's conscience, what God is in your mind, you must accept. There's no Bible. There's no pointing to Jesus. It is whatever God is in your mind, you must accept. So a Catholic priest can have the Yen for Zen. He can be a Zen Buddhist at the same time. The Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa at the major UN um, conferences on these issues, the New Age conferences, all these spiritual leaders coming together. 
Robert Ranzi, Franz König, the Dalai Lama, Catholics, Muslims, Sundus, Shintus, they all came together. And the Dalai Lama, of course, is just, well, the principle of Buddhism, just another sect of Hinduism, if you like. And he's called the God King, and he's a reincarnation of the original Lama. That's him on the left over there, and on the right, they have his next reincarnation here already. So I think this Lama is very confused in what body is supposed to be. <laughs> Time magazine calls him the God King. And he has the same titles as the papacy would have, as the Pope would have. These are God men that set themselves up to make mankind realize its divinity. There is no conflict between the religions of Buddhism and Catholicism in the inner circle. To the outer portico, it might appear so. They reach nirvana through works. They promise paradise. And the light comes out of the east. And so suddenly you have an explosion of God-men. This one over here is the promised God-man, the Rushira Avatar Adida Samrash. They have these interesting names. And of course, they're surrounded by doting women who have to all fall in love with him. This is amazing. When he comes into a room, everybody falls down and bows down and worships him. So man has become an object of worship. He writes himself, I am the avatar of brightness, the way of Adidam. It's not about seeking to be relieved of suffering. It's all about happiness. It's about being in love with me. All, as a condition of taking refuge in me, are obliged to fall in love with me. Do you know what? Jesus never forces anyone. Jesus says, when I be lifted up, I draw all men to me. I look at the cross and I say, Lord, why did you die for me? I was a miserable sinner. I was in these movements. I did all of these things. And you care so much about me. Then I will give you my love voluntarily. You see? Christianity is beautiful. But the world doesn't want Christianity. It wants God-men. Here is a free female goddess, Amrita Amanda Mai Ama. You can pray to her if you want to. Here she receives a Global Peace Initiative of Women, Religious and Spiritual Leaders Prize in Geneva in 2002. And she gets to be the spokesman at the United Nations and gives opening addresses. Here's Amma's United Nations address. There is one truth that shines through all creations, rivers, mountains, plants and animals, the sun, the moon, the stars, you and I. Oops, what's that? If, if I achieve one thing and you recognize pantheism wherever it is, in its sneakiest forms after this con Congress here, that we have here, then I will have achieved something. Because that's the Amiga that even threatens us. And this is the pervading worldview to bring everybody under one roof. And therefore, we may never be critical of any other organization because that's not politically correct. But how can people be converted from that to the living God if they never realize there's another way? So, all of us, there's an expression of this one reality. All religions must unite, is the bottom line of her message. The avatar, Meher Baba, all of these God. Notice the word Bab in all of them, they're all gates. Or this one over here, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, his divine grace, they're gods, you see. Uh, the Bhakti Dventata Swami Prabhupada Puddha, these names are incredible. He has one of the temples inside. He's sitting on his throne. Always triple arches, triple thrones, typical paganism, demon gods around him. And then the typical occult, 12 around one. 12 disciples around one. 12 vestal virgins around the Krishna. 12 sort of in-betweens around the Krishna. You see, everything goes in these religions because their god is androgenic. Notice that their Krishna God has breasts. See? 
And here is another one, the Sri Sri Sai Baba. He died. Fortunately, he's reincarnated. We'll see him just now. The Swami Direndra, he's the one who, who is the spiritual leader of the politicians in India and of the prime ministers of India. Uh, here is His Holiness Maharashi Mahesh Yogi. He says, if you don't accept transcendental meditation, you have no right to exist. And this is my personal favorite, uh, the Sai Baba, his present reincarnation. Twice daily, the Almighty God appears before his doting servants. He carries a flower and uh, he comes with a solid gold car and has all the religions uniting into one. See, Jesus the Christ here is just one of the many. He's not better than this one who is the Hindu deity up there. And here is a German fellow who comes from, wow, Lutheran stock worshipping Sai Baba in his room. Now, who runs these religions behind the scenes? Well, here you have the Jesuit Swamis. Jesuit Swamis adopt the dress, diet, and custom of the local Lingayats and Belgium district so to work with them more effectively. Swami Almandananda celebrating Mass the Indian way. These are Jesuits. Many of these top people posing as these God-men are nothing other than these in secret guys. Osho, who died in 1990, uh, here he is in one of his many Rolls Royces. Just have a look at this. I just met Bhagwan and there it was. It's nobody else than him. Bhagwan is my master and I love him. I'm in love with him. That's the only thing I can say after fleeing his native India, has purchased a 100-square-mile ranch in central Oregon, to which his red-clad disciples flock from all over the world. Whose astonishing title literally means highest spiritual teacher, lord of the universe, honorable sir, and king. Rolls Royces two or three times a day and is worshipped, literally adored by his thousands of Western followers. It is so saddening to see their devotion for a mere human being who considers him. We don't have to watch it all. That's enough. So these people are real and being worshipped all over the world. Ken Wilber, the New Age psychologist, says the great goddess Kali of India, when reviewed in her highest form, is the wife of Shiva. Blavatsky says, that's a symbol of Lucifer as well. It's the great goddess. And it tells us that there is an actual sacrifice in awareness. You become God, not a substitute sacrifice in blood. Away with Jesus. The fall was an evolutionary advance and perfect growth. It was experienced as a fall, but it brought to light our immortality. By eating of the tree of knowledge, men and women realized their mortal and finite state and they realized they had to leave Eden. They did not get thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They grew up and walked out. That's the same as Mormon teaching. The fall was upwards. Now let's get serious. Those are the channels through which the masses are geared towards this Cosmic Christ. Now let's go to the theologians. Matthew Fox, Episcopal theologian, Roman Catholic priest, and uh, one of the great thinkers and movers in the world today. He writes in the book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. This book is about the sacred and our response to it, reverence. The sacred what? The sacred everything. The sacred creation, stars, galaxies, whales, soil, da 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 The divine one in all things. What is that? Pantheism. I'm so proud of you. The Western term for this image, and he talks about the cosmic Christ, and then he says over here, the image of the divine one. It is my experience that only the human species dares to deny its divinity dares to deny the cosmic Christ. 
So if you deny that you are divine, you are denying the cosmic Christ. So, I deny that I am divine, I deny the cosmic Christ. Here it says, if my thesis is correct, it is time to move from the his quest for the historical Jesus to the cosmic Christ. He says we need a new ecumenism like the one that John the 23rd dreamed of, but a new one. He said this one would be deeply ecumenical and would call forth the wisdom of all the world's religions. See how they're moving to unite the religions of the world? All under one cosmic Christ. This cosmic Christ will make things happen. This cosmic Christ will lead to deep sexuality. That again is this androgenic union, and it is occult to the tenth degree. Deep worship, deep ecumenism, all of these things. And where will it lead to? The Eucharist, a promise of the maternal eros. So, divine sex with God. This is pretty sick. We actually hear some sermons like that in the world today, and that should make us really scared. Alice A. Bailey, high priestess of the New Age movement, speaks to Dwal Kool, writes all of these books. There are only two women who have written that much in the last two centuries. Only two women. She's one of them. Problems of humanity, the reappearance of the Christ. Notice that it is not Jesus Christ, it is the Christ. This one writes, Alice A. Bailey, she says, I dedicate myself anew to the service of the coming one, an acronym for Lucifer, and will do all I can to prepare men's minds and hearts for that event. The other prophet wrote that Jesus Christ is the only way. Interesting. Through the eyes of the masters, what do these initiates look like that came over the eons? You had the master Maroya, you had the Venetian master, there were nine great ones, the number nine is the other six, it's the occult symbol of the architect of the universe. You had the master Hilarion, then they tell you all kinds of lies, the master Serapsis, the master Mahuchan, the master Jesus. But it's interesting that the Master Jesus was overshadowed by the Christ. So Jesus is the only Master who wasn't the Master in himself. The Christ controlled him like a puppet. Satan hates Jesus. Did you know that? And you have the Master Mahochan and uh, the Master Kuthumi Lal Singh. What do they look like? And this is the one they're all waiting for, the Lord Maitreya, the Christ. The Bodhisattva, the Iman Mahdi, the Sri Krishna, the St. Patrick, the world teacher. And uh, he's here right now. There is his spokesman. This is his channel. This man is Benjamin Cream. And his organization is an official, associated organization within the United Nations. Not only that, his magazine, giving the channeled messages of Maitreya, is an official United Nations information document. Is that interesting or not? Yes, I find that interesting. Here he is. He says, revitalized Christian churches as well as Masonic lodges will be used for the purpose of giving the mass planetary initiation. And I showed you yesterday how the Masonic principles had come into the churches. So Maitreya knows what he's doing. He's preparing for his coming. He says, many will see me soon. Share with your brother this joyous expectation. We have another author who says, Satan will counterfeit the coming of Christ. With great splendor he will appear on this earth. Is that correct or not? Yes. Now, Let's have a look at what Benjamin Cream has to say on this issue. My dear friends, this is Channel. Be ready to see me soon. This is Matthias. Follow speaking. my thoughts. My advent is nigh. 
the world teacher for the new age of Aquarius, Maitreya Buddha, has been living in London, England, since 1977. The Buddha, 2,500 years ago, made a prophecy that at this time would come into the world another great Buddha, Buddha like himself, by name Maitreya, who would inspire humanity to create a brilliant golden civilization based, as he put it, on righteousness and truth. And that's what Maitreya has come to do. Think calm, tension between the eyebrows. He's a member of the Asian community of London. He lives there as an apparently ordinary man, although those around him know him as a very exceptional man. Everything I hear, he hears. He can teach through me, he can, he can inspire, he can heal, and, and so on. So he has a kind of vehicle, like a window in the world, through whom he can work. He told me to get a tape recorder, which I did, a little Grundig portable, and he began to give me long dictations, which I repeated under the microphone. And one night, three months after the initial contact, I heard the voice of Maitreya, and he said very little, it was very simple. He said, I myself am coming. It will be the most extraordinary evolutionary step which humanity will take. We can either accept the principle of sharing or else destroy life. The, the tensions inherent in the discrepancy in living standards between the developed world and the third world are such as they have within them the seeds of a third world war. That would be nuclear and would destroy all life human and subhuman. But we have to make the choice. We have to invite him, we have to invite him forward and to come onto the radio and television networks of the world. And on the day of declaration, it will be the most extraordinary experience for humanity. We will see his face on the television screens, whatever you have access to television. But he won't speak, he won't say anything. But his thoughts and his ideas will enter telepathically into the minds of all humanity he will come into mental, telepathic contact with the whole of humanity simultaneously. See the light which beckons you into the future. Or oh, sound forever the knell of regret. Interesting. So he writes, the reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom. These are all channeled books. And he says, the Master Jesus will take over the throne of St. Peter's. He also said that the previous Pope was the last Pope before the final events. But that's an exciting story. I'll be dealing with that in a future lecture here. The law of God is very important. I am the conveyors of God's love, the administrator of God's will. There's going to be a law that's going to be enforced by him. There must be adequate supply of food, housing, health care, achievement, social, political justice for all. So there must be a redistribution of wealth. That's another interesting factor. And then he says, notice again, the time has come to begin the process of change to transform the life of men in such a way that the God in man shines forth. This, my friends, is not difficult for the accomplishment, for within you all such, such a divine being. Do you recognize him? Yes. If we know the principles of occultism, we have no problem recognizing this. And then he says, theology is usually useless and arguments of a scripture wasteful energy. Simply take the theme of loving and live it. Preach love till it drips. But please, make no distinction between right and wrong. Because we are all one pantheistic soup of Babylonian confusion. That's the theology of the world today. Why not preach a difference? Why not show people there's a better way? I ask you to accept this new level of understanding. If you cling to every phrase of the Bible and argue its interpretation, you miss the point of God's message. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Pity that they've taken that out of the new translations. 
What a pity. But I believe it. I believe every word of God. Fact of the Christ. Fact of the hierarchy. hierarchy. The time between now and the reappearance of the Christ is very short. Learn the great invocation. And all our children all over the world have to learn this great invocation. It sounds so nice, but if you know occultism, it tramples the Son of God underfoot. I don't want to read it. I hate it. Without sharing, no justice. Without justing, no peace. Without peace, no future. We'll talk about those things. Then, appearances suddenly. Mystery appearances, crosses appear, and Matreya appears in 1988, his first appearance, where else but with Sister Maria's church. And that is what he looked like. He appeared in Nairobi, in this little church, and that is his emblem. Notice the swastika in the middle, symbol of the sun god. This is occultism plus the symbol of all the religions of the world uniting around the cosmic Christ, setting up the new world religion. Maitreya, as he appeared in Nairobi in 1988, here he is. Uh, oh boy, he looks scary. He looks scary. But the people worshipped him. Many were healed. Of course, CNN was there and photographed the whole affair and watched as the mystic walked away and disappeared into thin air and broadcast this worldwide. But then, of course, Ted Turner was the founder of CNN, and he was a high occultist, so maybe they had some inside connections, you know, wires, I don't know. They had some advance warning that Maitreya would be there. Look at the people bowing down to him. And he appeared on television sets here and there, just as a foretaste. Jesus appears on national television. The television switched themselves on. It happened in the States here and there. It happened in Australia. It happened in various places of the world. Jesus stars on American television. And then his actual appearances. 1998 in Cyprus, in Iceland, in Argentina, in Russia, in China, in Austria, in Canada. He's a busy man in Oregon. In 1999, in Croatia, he appeared to 100 Christians. In China, to 200 Muslims. In Poland, to 150 Christians. In the Sudan, to 150 Muslims. Do you think they're trying to achieve something? And to 500 fundamentalist Christians, Chicago, Illinois. So these are eyewitnesses. And then in Venezuela, in Sweden, in, the Missis in Jackson, in Switzerland, Switzerland, very interesting. What a coincidence. I was lecturing in Switzerland, and that night I was lecturing on the New Age movement. And the audience is so secular, so skeptic, that halfway through the lecture, some crowd got up in the lecture and said, Matreya, what rubbish, we're not going to listen to you. Go back to the bush to Africa where you belong. And the half the audience got up and walked out of my lecture was very embarrassing. <laughs> I'm very pleased you're not doing it. <laughs> but this is the interesting thing. In the hotel next door, I was speaking to 3,000 people. In the hotel next door, Matreya was overshadowing Benjamin Cream. At the exact same time, unbeknown to me, while I was giving this lecture. And just as my audience, most of them believers, skeptical believers, walked out, these people rushed into the street shouting with exuberance, Matreya is here, Matreya is here. And they were handing out pamphlets and going crazy in the streets of Zurich. And my audience was so shocked they ran back in and sat down. God is good sometimes. <laughs> Always. In 2001, he appeared in the Argentine, in Brazil, in India, in Poland, in China, in New Zealand. And there are the numbers and who he appeared to, to Buddhists and Christians and all of them alike. And then, Paraguay. 
This was his last public appearance in the year 2002. Because since 2002 to now, the world is ready for the final event. The final initiation of Maitreya as the cosmic Christ. You know what, brothers and sisters? We are closer to the end than we might realize. We know about the second coming being in power and glory. He comes with the clouds to punish those who know not God, to redeem God's people. He comes with his angels and every eye will see him from the east to the west and the resurrection of the righteous will take place. I am longing for the real coming of Christ. I don't want to have a Christ that is seen on television. I want one where every eye shall see him. And every eye, not only every eye, but every knee shall bow. And he which testifies of these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. So come, Lord Jesus. We are in the final moments of this earth's history. The next two lectures will make it even clearer. May God help us as we, as harborers of God's truth, knowing the three angels' messages, preach this to the world so that as many as possible may still be saved. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Thank you for prophecy. Thank you for the gift of prophecy. Thank you that we may know that these things will happen and we see them happening before our eyes. And Lord, your people are asleep, just like you predicted. I'm so glad, Lord, that you have given all these things in your word and your word cannot be destroyed and so we know that you are in control in spite of what is happening around you. We know, Lord, that you allow evil to ripen to ripeness. And then a great shaking must occur. And your people must be ready to deliver the loud cry. O Lord of hosts, enable us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.